All right, thank you uh, very much for the invitation to be here, particularly Warwick for uh, sending me the email. I, I know I was to one of the very first large herd seminars years ago, and uh, wow, it's really grown and very impressive uh, event here. As I was uh, flipping through my slides this morning, I thought, well, maybe I should really change the title here a little bit to uh, Transition Cow Diets, Why I'm Confused and Why You Should Probably Also Be Confused. Uh, it's, it's not real clear cut. As I look through the literature, so we're going to take a look at some of the research that's been done, particularly as it relates to uh, protein and energy. Here's the uh, outline of the talk that we're going to go through today. And our first item of business is talking about steaming up close-up transition cows or the feeding of additional grain during the last few weeks prior to, prior to parturition. When I went back to look through the literature to see when this concept started, the first reference that I could find on it was actually from a a gentleman, and excuse me if I'm mispronouncing the name, Robert Buttflower, at the World Dairy Congress, 1928. He first proposed the steam up ration as a way to circumvent the neglect of the preparation of the cows for her lactation period. The term was meant to be an analogy to the preparation of a steam thresher. So the concept goes back a long, long time. And up until probably the early 2000s, 2003 or so, I was an advocate of this. I was a co-author of the 2001 NRC. And in the unique uh, aspects section, we, we promoted steaming up transition dairy cows. The reasons being for doing this was varied over time. Probably originally, it revolved around adapting the microflora to get the rumen microorganisms changing over to the type that would be readily able to uh, function well as far as digesting the higher concentrate diets that would come after calving. In the mid-80s, a German study suggested maybe one of the reasons for doing it was to, to grow the rumen papillae, that when you fed additional grain, the papillae grew and lengthened. You needed time to do that, and these papillae then would be a nice long, elongated structures that would be able to absorb copious amounts of acids that would come following calving when organic matter intake would increase and the fermentability of that organic matter would increase. Where our lab sort of came into it was a concept of providing more energy to the cow because we knew that when you increase the concentrate, you increase dry matter intake. It was of a higher energy density. That seemed to make sense in a cow that was naturally going off feed during those last three weeks prior to calving. And we thought that by doing that, by getting more energy into the cow, you could perhaps decrease fat mobilization around the time of calving, and that could also be beneficial to the cow. A grad student actually came to my office, again, it was in the early 2000s, and said, hey boss, I think you're delivering the wrong message. <clears throat> And he put a list of studies together, which I have since, ex since expanded. There's about 13 studies that are on this slide that represent studies in which two different levels of NFC were being fed during the close-up period. In each of these studies, cows would go on to a common diet after calving so that they could look at the carryover effects of these transition cow diets. A lot of numbers up there. I just want to focus your attention to perhaps two sets. This one, the two levels of NFC were 13 and 28, versus this one where it was 38 and 45. So we have a wide variation of experimental treatments that have look, been looked at at these experiments over time. So we've got the highs and the kind of lows and everything in betweens for experimental treatment. So, in one way, it's, it's sort of a robust data set. I'm going to go through a, a summary of these studies. And essentially, 10 of the 13 studies measured prepartum feed intake. And in eight of those 10 studies, there was a statistically significant increase in prepartum dry matter intake. So there's no question in my mind that if you do increase the the concentrate feeding during this period of time, 
the cows will increase feed intake. Um, why they do it, I don't know, because most situations they're over-consuming energy, and you'd think of anything they'd back off feed, but they do not. They seem to increase feed intake during that period of time. Nine of the studies reported dry matter intake after calving, and in zero of, their, of those studies was there any significant effect on postpartum dry matter intake. In other words, this advantage that was realized prepartum did not carry over to the postpartum period. Eleven of the studies monitor milk yield after calving, and in zero of those eleven studies was there any significant increase in milk yield. Our laboratory was very interested in, in liver fat and methods to control liver fat. Five of these studies took liver biopsies the week after the study, and only one of the five studies showed any significant reduction in liver fat. Another question then becomes, what about health and reproduction? And unfortunately, these studies were small studies. They simply didn't have adequate numbers of animals to adequately assess health and reproduction. In other words, parameters that are yes or no in, in their answers. My argument would be, however, that if there's no effect, carryover effect on dry matter intake and there's no carryover effect on milk yield, there's probably no carryover effect on energy balance. And therefore, perhaps the likelihood of there being significant effects on health and reproduction are diminished because of that. So, why after 100 years do we no longer need to steam up cows? I think a big part of it is the feeding of TMRs. Or conversely, the elimination of slug feeding of grain. When you go back to the initial proposal to feed cows additional grain prior to calving, grain was being fed separately from forage, but now we're basically in TMR feeding situations in much of the world anyway, and it eliminates that feeding large amounts of grain at any one time. I think another reason is really there's low feed intake during the time of calving. I measured a lot of ruminal pHs during my time at the University of Wisconsin in cows right after calving, and it's really tough to get low pHs in the rumen. And the reason I think that is is because their organic matter intake just isn't that high. There's not a lot of fermentable substrate coming into the cow at that one time. So the pH challenge really isn't that tremendous. And again, with feeding TMRs post-calving, as that consumption of the TMR gradually increases, we're gradually adapting the cow to grain at that period of time. All right, so where do the controversies come up? Well, I think one of them would be, well, what about high straw diets, or the Goldilocks diets that are being used in, in many countries now. That database I showed you really wasn't cows coming off Goldilocks diets, so is there a difference there? I know of one study that was done at the University of Illinois that looked at that. On these Goldilocks diets, is it beneficial to increase grain during the last three weeks? And the answer was there really was no difference. But that's one data set, and I think we need more research in that area. Again, in many situations, concentrates are still fed from forage, and again, their game off. Yep, maybe, maybe we need to steam up cows. I put this one on you for you folks because I know very little concerning the feeding of grass silage diets. This last one you run into quite often, again, as I travel around the world, is that many times I, I think we do get into situations where energy requirements of the animal prefresh are not being met because of some adverse situations like extreme heat, poorly designed transition pens, poor ventilation, et cetera. So that may be other situations where we may still want to steam up the cow. All right, from this research, though, there was a certain message, I think, that was conveyed to the dairy industry, and that is you can feed one dry cow diet that contains you know, low energy, poor quality roughages for the entire dry period. That makes sense. If you don't have to steam them up, just, just feed them that far off dry cow diet for the entire uh, dry period. Which leads us to our next topic, and that's the controlled energy diets or 
The Goldilocks diets fed for the entire dry period. So when we talk about controlled energy diets, we're talking about diets that are high in poor quality forage, typically quite high in straw. The theory is that these cows are less insulin resistant as they go through the close-up transition period and postpartum. Conversely, they are more insulin sensitive. And because the insulin is an anti-lipolytic hormone, you would have lower rates of lipolysis. That would lead to less fat in the liver and lower ketone bodies in blood. We're not going to spend time on this. There's a kind of a controversy as to what it does with dry matter intake postpartum. I personally think that there is a small transition uh, advantage in feed intake of cows coming off these diets, but it quickly disappears. Good data that says that there's fewer displaced abomasums. And again, the question is, does that provide the need for just one diet during the dry period? Experimentally, this has been actually looked at using two different models. The one model is to feed ad libitum intake of a diet with very low energy density or high straw diets. Practical, you can apply this in the real world from an experimental standpoint. There's usually a control treatment that has moderate energy density versus a low energy density diet. Both of them are fed ad libitum. Typically in these experiments, the control diet Moderate energy diet fed ad libitum, the cows will be consuming about 150% of their energy requirement where the cows fed the high straw diets or, or fed ad libitum are usually around 100% of the requirement. In the following graphs, those studies will be shown by the blue bars. Another model that has been used is just to have one diet, a moderate energy density diet, that you either feed ad libitum or you restrict the amount that you allow the cow to consume. Obviously, in group feeding situations, that's, that's not practical. It works in experimental herds with stanchion barns, for example. So typically, we have a control moderate energy density diet fed ad libitum or restricted so that we have, again, about 150% on the control in most of the experimental diets in which there was the feed restriction imposed. They came out close to about 80% 80, 80 of the cow's energy requirement. On the following slides, these will be shown in, in the red bars. So first thing we're going to take a look at is NEFA concentrations postpartum. And what I'm expressing is that the change that occurred with feeding the controlled energy diet. So you can see the, the data is actually quite convincing that you do get lower NEFA concentrations in most of these studies. So it looks like you do get a situation where there's an anti-lipolytic effect. Beta-hydroxybutyrate, similarly, it looks like there's a decrease in BHBA concentration in the great majority of studies, which perhaps matches with that less fat being mobilized from the back. Liver triglyceride, perhaps a little bit more mixed, but again, I think a, a fairly convincing argument that there can be decreases in liver triglyceride. Again, this fits with the NEFA data, the cows mobilizing less fat off of the back. Here's where the diet becomes a little bit more perhaps confusing and, and controversial. The, this is the milk yield response, and you can see it varies quite, quite dramatically across these diets. Now, I got the, the differences in pounds per day. I apologize for that. But you can see in some of these diets, there were some fairly large reductions in milk output. Taking a look at milk fat percentage, this is actually fairly convincing evidence that would suggest that, that you get a reduction in, in milk fat percent in these cows coming off the controlled energy diets. So the studies would report either energy or fat-corrected milk. So I've got the differences put out here. So this is really a combination of that fat percentage effect and milk yield effect. And again, you can see there are several of these studies that show that there are quite marked reductions in the energy output of the cows following calving. 
And to me, that, that makes total, total sense. If these cows, in fact, do mobilize less fat, or NEFA, NEFA are, in fact, used by the mammary gland as an energy source and a precursor for milk fat synthesis, either directly or after they've been processed through the liver and incorporated into a lipoprotein and exported. So if you do, in fact, reduce the NEFA availability of the mammary gland, it should not be surprising that there may be some downstream effect on the lactation performance of these animals. In reality, the goal is to have a balancing act to provide sufficient NEFA to the mammary gland to support lactation without experiencing the potential negative effects that can result if NEFA mobilization is excessive. And I'm glad to see that Dr. Newbold is in the audience. Um, we were at the Nottingham Conference, I believe it was in, in 2004, and the book was published, I think, in 2005, and he gave a pre presentation called Liver Function in Dairy Cows. And it was actually a, a brilliant paper. I was, I was a little embarrassed because it's much better than anything that I would have put together, but he had a, a, really, a really a great quote in this, and he said, nutritional restriction to adipose tissue mobilization might be necessary. But there is a philosophical problem. We have selected cows that have increased reliance on mobilized body reserves as a source of nutrients for milk production. The farmer has paid the geneticist for this. Are we now going to ask him to pay the nutritionist to work in the opposite direction? We have our priorities wrong. We should explore what can be done to help the liver deal with mobilized fatty acids before considering whether we need to reduce the amount of fatty acid supply to the liver. So I leave you with that thought. It's over 10 years old now, but uh, I still think a very interesting concept. So regarding controlled energy diets, you know, what are the controversies or issues? What explains the variability in, in milk yield response? And again, I think if I was an academic rather than mostly retired, I'd probably go back and try to figure that out and perhaps design some experiments to, to answer my hypothesis. The point I want to make is I don't think the optimal level of energy density has been determined. If you're going to feed one diet for the entire dry period, should we be at 100%? I think probably not. Should we be at 150%? I think probably not. I think what we really need is more research to do some type of dose titration to see where the optimal level would be. Again, the question becomes, is there a steam amount needed if you're using a controlled energy diet? And that perhaps could be employed pre-fresh, or it could be employed as a post-fresh sort of transition diet. And then I think the answer still needs to be uh, asked or the question has to be asked for each individual is, would we still need a close-up diet? Maybe not additionally for more concentrate or NFC, but perhaps to incorporate items such as anionic salts, yeasts, menensin, rumor-protected choline, or whatever, whatever your issues are that you want to address. All right, from there I'd like to kind of switch gears to the post-fresh cow talk about a little bit about the hepatic oxidation theory and, and starch feeding. A lot of, lot of questions regarding starch feeding post-calving. Post and it's amazing the neglect of, of data that we have in this period of time. Most early lactation studies start three or four weeks after calving because nobody wants to put a transition cow on a study because they may lose it, right? And replication is key. So we actually have very little data in this area, but a lot of questions. Potential benefits of increasing starch in post-fresh diets, increased energy density, greater feed intake, perhaps greater milk yield, less fat mobilization, because she might be in less ener negative energy balance and less metabolic orders, disorders. But what about the negative effects of putting too much starch in or too quickly? susceptibility to displaced abomasums, acidosis, and some have suggested that increasing starch or fermentability of starch during the first few weeks postpartum, if excessive, can potentially reduce 
feed intake of the animal. Mike Allen at Michigan State University developed the hepatic oxidation theory, or HOT, and I've got the uh, sort of the dummies version of that because that's pretty much what I am, but basically it says that if we feed starch, that gets converted to propionate in the rumen. Propionate's taken up by the liver. Two fates, one would be conversion of glucose, one would be oxidation. If there's excessive or too much oxidation, this sends basically satiety signals to the brain to depress feed intake. And there was a fair body of literature that was developed by Dr. Allen Regarding, post, or regarding ruminal infusion of propionate that supported this theory. But the theory did not go unchallenged. This was work that was done at Cornell University by Tom Overton's group. His concept was, boy, at this time the cow's starving, starving for glucose of that propionate that gets to the liver. How much really goes through oxidation versus gets converted to, to glucose? So he set up a two by two factorial. He had 21 and a half versus 26 percent starch. He fed that during weeks one through three postpartum. He had a second factor, which was with menensin, with or without menensin, 400 milligrams per day, three weeks pre to calving, after calving, 450 milligrams per day to 63 weeks post. And why this becomes an interesting second factor to look at is because menensin affects the rumen microbiota such that there's additional propionate being produced per unit of feed intake. So if we take a look at the feed intake from this study, you can see that there was no decrease in feed intake with a starch diet. In fact, it was slightly higher. Again, the menensin, there was no decrease in feed intake. And again, it was slightly higher. So this, in fact, was not really supporting the hepatic oxidation theory. As a follow-up, there's no difference in milk yield based on starch levels of these diets. There was an increase in milk yield with the cows that were fed menensin. This is data that was recently published after Dr. Allen, out of Dr. Allen's lab. He, he kind of refined his hypothesis by saying, well, you know, it's not so much starch, but probably the critical factor maybe is the fermentability of the starch. So he designed this experiment in which he had two corn sources. One would be dry corn or the low fermentability starch versus high moisture corn, the high fermentability starch. Formulated the diets at 26.5% starch, fed them 0 to 28 days. Then they all went on to a common diet, so there was a postpartum period to look at carryover effects. Results, there were no differences in dry matter intake for the first 28 days. I've got the milk yield and the fat corrected milk yield, again, in pounds per day. Plotted here, the advantage went to the animals that were fed the high moisture corn, significantly so, not significantly so for the fat corrected milk because some bit of fat depression with the high moisture corn. At that point in time, they said, well, I, I think the issue was we didn't challenge them enough on starch to see the fermentability effect. So this study was presented last year at the American Dairy Science Association. It was a two by two factorial arrangement of treatments, 22 versus the 28% starch corn replacing soy hulls to get the difference, and again using high moisture corn versus dry ground corn. Diets were formulated to be 22% forage NDF, 17% crude protein. Treatments were applied 23 days, a carryover effect after that in which they went on to a common 30% starch diet. Starch level did not affect dry matter intake, but Feeding the dry ground corn increased dry matter intake 2.2 kilograms per day during the treatment period. The effect diminished during the carryover period. The dry ground corn increased milk yield 2.6 kilograms per day. Fat corrected milk 4.3 kilograms per day. 
Or conversely, the high moisture corn or the more fermentable corn depressed feed intake and depressed milk yield. Now there was an interaction such that the dried ground corn effect were mainly accounted for by the high starch diet. So that did support his theory that if you get starch high enough, then this fermentability issue can become an issue with propionate perhaps causing reductions in feed intake and lactation performance. So where do we come up with the controversies then? Well, why, why such contradictory results across these studies? Is it dependent on perhaps pre-fresh starch level? What diets these experimental animals were coming off of? Was it indeed due to the level, or perhaps more importantly, the fermentability of the starch? Is the response dependent on other carbohydrate sources in the diet? There's some research going on now at Cornell saying, is it dependent on NDF and the digestibility of the NDF in these diets? So clearly more research is needed to find really the optimal starch feeding level for transition cows. At this point, though, I would say that it appears that cows will tolerate 26% starch in the fresh cow diet. And beyond that, the extent of the fermentability may, in fact, affect dry matter intake and production. OK, so now we're going to switch gears to protein. First, we're going to think about the pre-fresh cow. And in 2001, the NRC came up for requirements for protein in the pre-fresh cow. They considered the maintenance requirement, growth if it was a heifer, and they considered the requirements for pregnancy. The 2001 NRC did not account for mammary growth. And the reason it did not account for mammary growth is because there was no peer revere peer-reviewed research available at the time. Mike Vanderhaard came up with an estimate. It was published in a conference proceeding, but the NRC can't use information out of conference proceedings. But his estimate was that could be as much as 130 grams per day of MP needed, which could actually increase the, the units, one to two percentage units per day. What I've done on the next slide is I've calculated, according to the 2001 NRC, crude protein percentage needed in diets by taking their metabolizable protein requirement, dividing it by 0.7 to convert it back to crude protein, and estimating it by, or dividing by the estimated dry matter intake published in the NRC. And this is how it falls out. At, at date minus 21, we have the heifer, and we have the cow. The blue bars are without considering any kind of a mammary requirement. The red bars are considering the, the van der Haar estimates. <clears throat> so you can see that at that point in time, three weeks out, eh, the heifer's around 12 to 13 percent. We'll address this later. The, the mature cow's around 8 to 9 percent, and we're not going to recommend that, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. You get to day seven, so now you start to get a bit of a drop off in feed intake a little bit additional requirement to the growth of the fetus. And you're up now around 13 to 15% for the heifer. Still very, very low for the cow. You come up to day minus one, and now, now that's really considering a pretty drastic dip in feed intake that occurs that last day or so before she calves. And the heifer's up to about 16 to 18. The cow is still at, at less than 12%. I'm not going to go into a lot of details because there have been several excellent reviews reviewing the effect of prepartum crude protein on postpartum performance. Some of them are listed here. Buzz Burhands in 2006 reviewed 13 studies that included 21 treatment comparisons. He said for almost all the prepartum protein level comparisons, there were no significant differences by treatment for either milk volume. 19 out of 21 were non-significant or protein yield. 20 out of the 21 comparisons were non-significant. Remarkably, despite the wide variation in the amount and degradability of the prepartum crude protein, there were similarly negligible differences in postpartum intake, postpartum energy, metabolites, or health. 
But again, these reviews, because of the available that information, because of the available information in the publications, geared around crude protein and did not evaluate weight metabolizable protein. One other study I want to show, and it's sort of the standard for this uh, topic, is the parity difference issue that I showed on previous slides. This was a study that was done at UC Davis, Peter Robinson's lab, 11.7 versus 14.4 percent crude protein fed to either animals in their late gestation as a, a heifer going into their first calving or older animals. The extra protein was brought in by feeds that were high in undegradable protein. And this study did show that, in fact, there was a treatment difference for the heifers with increased milk yield. There was a tendency, though, for a decrease in milk fat percentage. But for the mature cows, there was absolutely no difference. Heifers basically have this higher requirement for crude protein because of their growth. And the other thing is they eat less. And you say, well, duh. But I don't mean kilograms of dry matter. I mean when you express it as a percentage of body weight, they actually eat less than a mature cow. And that is what leads to the higher protein requirements. I do want to comment that diet should never go below 12% crude protein. We actually did some work on this at the UW, looking at fiber digestion in Dacron bags. And in fact, you will reduce fiber digestibility if you get less than 12% crude protein. So you reduce fiber digestibility. We didn't measure microbial growth, but there's good data that suggests if you get below 12% crude protein, you'll impair microbial growth, at least in, in other animals other than, than close-ups. I don't know of any studies that have looked at it in close-ups. Requirements, according to NRC for heifers, is about 1,000. For cows, it's 860. Here again is the, the Vander R estimate. So we end up with heifers at 14, and again, cows at about 12%. So where does the controversy come in? It's, it's actually pretty, I don't know about the UK, but it's pretty common in the US to, to recommend higher levels of metabolizable protein, even, even for mature animals above 1,000. It's not uncommon to see 1,200 to 1,300 grams of metabolizable protein recommended. To my knowledge, you got to look at that as a safety data because I know of no data to support it. I don't know what's going to happen in the next NRC, but, but I'd be surprised if it's changed. It is true that if you are feeding the high straw diets, that may mandate a higher percent crude protein or a higher percent RUP because of the lower microbial MP cont contribution on these very high, poor quality fiber diets. But that's a percentage. That doesn't mean the grams of metabolizable protein requirement changes. The one thing that I will caution you about is if you start flirting with levels above 14% crude protein, there are some studies in the literature that suggest that you may have negative effects on postpartum dry matter intake. So, if anybody just think, well, safety net, let's just, let's just ramp it right up, there may be some postpartum consequences. All right, the last topic for this morning's presentation is going to be the, the feeding of postpartum protein. You know, this, this is really actually very similar to the starch story. There's very little research specific to zero to three week postpartum period. Conceptually, protein is very similar to energy from the standpoint is that there's a high need for whether you want to look at it from an amino acid standpoint, an MP or CP standpoint, due to lactation. And there's very low dry matter intake. So conceptually, you know, it's a similar, similar situation with energy. But it's different than energy. From the standpoint, there are limits to the amount of corn and fat that can be fed. I mean, we just, we just can't make that cow into a pig from, a, from an energy standpoint. But, well, I'm sure there are some, but practically there's really no, no limit conceptually to the amount of protein uh, 
or the amino acid density of these diets. Clearly, there is pressure to reduce dietary protein in diets because of the effects on the environment and the effects on the wallet. It's an expensive feed source. So it's very common in the U.S. now to drive this crude protein, perhaps with amino acid supplementation, as low as possible. This is out of a review by Alan Bell, and, and the story really hasn't changed any. That, again, you can see these cows can go into significant negative MP balances immediately postpartum. He's got it up to 600 grams per day. And I've run into situations where I've done some estimates that in, in some high-producing cows, it can even go higher, closer to 900 per day. So these animals are, are in a deficit. And what I'm going to share with you, and it's only one experiment, but in all the time that I've done research, this is actually, I think, one of the neater, cooler experiments that I've, I've ever seen. It's a Danish study. Out of Larson's group, it was uh, kind of a follow-up. They had conducted some research indicating that cows may mobilize five kilograms of essential, acid, essential amino acids during the first month of lactation. So they designed an experiment in which on day one postpartum, they had a control, or cows were abomasally infused with casein, 360 grams. On day two, they bumped it up to 720 grams of abomasal infusion of casein. And then at, from day 2 to day 29, they gradually backed off, going from 720 down to 194. So why I think this is kind of a cool experiment is because basically they're mainlining MP, right? They're, they're putting in a protein that's, that's highly digestible and it's got you know, the, the ideal amino acid profile. So the basal diet that they used was 159 grams of crude protein per kilogram of dry matter, or 15.9% crude protein. This was the MP value in your program. It's a typo. I think I've got a different number, but 97 grams of MP per kilogram of dry matter. They balanced for a metabolizing to methionine ratio of, of 3.1. So here's, here's the milk yield response, or the MP supply, excuse me, the MP supply. So you can see the advantage of MP coming from the experimental group. This is the milk yield response, and we've got 43.8 versus 36.6 .6 or 7.2 kilogram of milk production response, resulting in about a 450 gram response in milk protein production per day. And I think this very nicely illustrates the challenge that we have in our postpartum cows relative to the requirements and trying to meet the requirements for MP. Now I understand that if you make alterations in your diet, you're not going to get this kind of a response, right? Because you're not going to abomasally infuse and you're not going to use casein. Um, so you're going to have to use a less perfect system. But again, I think it presents the challenge to at least try to obtain it. So where do the controversies come in? Do the cost of protein supplements and environmental concerns, there's pressure to scale back percent crude protein in the diet. My warning is that the post-fresh cows, you need to be careful. How low can you go with cows that are in this kind of an MP deficit? I'm not sure that that's an area in which I would want to experiment. Does this argue for a 21-day post-fresh pen that allows a brief period of time of, of high crude protein or high MP? Or perhaps this is a time to consider feeding rumen-protected amino acids to reduce the crude protein and create some space for energy. I think this is largely uncharted territory. Now, I know as Brits, you probably don't like to hear this message of a separate post-fresh group, right? Because everywhere I go, well, we really don't have a post-fresh group here, but here's an argument to at least <laughs> try to think of ways or get it done, or at least it's an argument when you're formulating that one diet for the entire lactation. 
how low do you want to go if that diet's going to be fed to the just fresh cows? Because as we know, if we can get them higher in peak milk, that advantage will carry over for a while and give you some economic benefits. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude. I have no idea where I am on time. But if there is time, I'd be willing to entertain some questions.